For today, I wanted to bring your attention to the very last paragraph in, the parsh, in this week's Parsha. The very last paragraph in Parsha's Vayikra. You know that the book of Vayikra deals with all different kinds of korbanot, different kinds of sacrifices that we bring to Hashem. Some are devotional sacrifices that are offered voluntarily. Some are offered because of the, of the holy day, the holiness of the day. Some are done to atone for <coughs> impurity. And some are done to atone for sin. This particular korban that is discussed at the very end of, Sefer Vay- of Parshas Vayikra is to atone for a sin that a person has committed. And he's committed it against his fellow man, strangely enough. Normally, you don't bring a korban for something that you've done against your fellow man. This is one of the exceptions. Yeah. What is the case over here? The case over here that says in Pasuk Chaf Aleph, Perakei, Pasuk Chaf Aleph, Nefesh Kisecheta, Uma'ala Ma'al Badoshem. If a person will sin and do an act of rebellion against God, and the way that our sages understand this passage is any time that I have misappropriated something from somebody else that is of value, either I've stolen from that person or the person has given me something for safekeeping and asks for it back and I deny having it, or any other kind of situation where I know that I owe this person, but for whatever reason I decide I'm going to deny giving that thing that I owe back to that person. Or, or I find something that I know belongs to somebody else and I decide to keep it for myself, I find it. And then what do I do? Not only do I deny having it, but the nishba al shakya. I swear falsely. And that's really the offense against Hashem, which is why you need to bring a korban. So the Torah says, that when the person shall sin and then feel guilty. So what is he doing? He's going to confess. And he says, you know what? I know that I swore in God's name that I don't owe you the object but my conscience won't allow me to, uh, to continue, and I have to come clean. So he comes clean, Behishiv is ha-gizela, asher gazal, etc., etc. So he returns the item. So are we done? Everything's good now? Not so fast. You swore falsely against God. You made your fellow feel like he was crazy. So therefore, the Torah says in Pasuk Havdalid, the shilam oso birosho, the chamishi sub yosef alav. That you have to pay an additional fifth of the value of the object. So if I stole something that was worth a hundred dollars, or I held it back from someone, how much do I have to give him? Twenty. You would you would think because a fifth of a hundred is hundred and twenty, but that's actually not the way Chazal understand it. They say it's hundred twenty-five. Most, there's a machlokes, but the majority opinion says it's, you got to give them what, what is really a quarter, because what, the way, there's a, two different ways of doing the math here. One way of doing the math is to say you take a fifth of what you stole and add, tack that on top as a penalty. But a fifth here could also mean um, when, you, when you take the, the total of how much I'm going to give him, and divide it into five parts, then four out of those five parts are what I originally stole, and the fifth part is the penalty. So looking at it that way, the fifth part, when I divide whatever I'm going to total, I'm going to give him is a total of five parts, it turns out to be a quarter of what I originally took. So there's a debate, but we'll just call it a fifth for now, just to simplify the issue. And then the Torah says, in Pasuk But then, for having sworn falsely, you're guilty to Hashem as well. And therefore, you have to bring a korban asham, a guilt offering, which is a ram um, as, a, as a sacrifice. And if you do those two things, you pay the extra fifth, and you bring the ram as an atoning sacrifice, 
the person shall be forgiven. Okay. So I want you to take a look for just a moment at the Kliyakar. And the Kliyakar has two short paragraphs on this mitzvah, on this halacha, at the end of Parshas Vayikra. And he, the first part that he goes on is that when a person shall sin and express guilt or express remorse. So he says something very telling. Piresh Rashi, so he first he quotes Rashi, who says, Kishiyakir ba'atzmo lashuv b'teshuva. When the person will be self-inspired to do tshuva. He's got to really look at himself in the mirror and say, you know what, I can do better. I've really got to do better. And he explains, he says, Kikol chotei la'olam lo yasim asham nafsho. He says, because most people who sin don't look at themselves as guilty parties. The derech ish yashar be'enav. Everyone considers himself or herself innocent and just. Ki hu morela asmo heter b'chol derachav. Every person offers rationalizations. We always, you know, you know when I find myself doing this, and I, I'm the first person to admit that I am guilty many times of rationalizing. When I'm in a rush to get somewhere, there are times when I unintentionally or intentionally cut off someone else in traffic. And I find myself cursing the person who cut me off in traffic, but when I cut off someone else in traffic, well, I'm sorry, but I, 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 got, I have to do this, you know. I mean, of course, you know, because I got to go do a mitzvah. That person didn't have to do a mitzvah, so he had no right to cut me off. Now, is it just me? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. It's American. It's all American. It's, it's American. <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're right. I don't think Canadians think that way. I think it's aggressive Americans who think that way. But I have found myself doing this, and I realize that I am one of the biggest hypocrites on the road. So I really, really try to put my ego in check when I'm driving. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But anyway, that's the point he's trying to say. Everyone, oh, I didn't do anything wrong when I cut off the person drive. Of course, I'm justified because I have to get to the uh, holy experience that the world, I need to save the world. Of course, no. nothing wrong with what I do. Or, let's say in, in the case over here, yes, it's true, you know, I have something that belongs to him, but you know why I, I'm not going to give it back to him? Because 10 years ago, I lent him my power drill, and he never, or I lent her a cup of flour, and she never gave it back. I brought her a dozen eggs, and she said she was going to pay me for them, and she never gave me back for those eggs. And so I'll be darned if I'm going to let her snooker me a second time. So even though I told her that I would give her the money that I owe her, forget it. Because of that thing that happened 10 years ago, and I'm right. Everyone's justified in their own eyes, right? <laughs> or for any other reason. He did something so offensive to me. Why does, should I have to give him back what that thing that he gave me? That's why the Torah says, you got to look at yourself in the mirror. Recognize your mistake. And realize that two wrongs don't make a right, and you know you can't try to offer any kind of rationalization. What? Be honest, and therefore admit to your wrongs. Zesha Amar ve'ashem, and that's what the Torah means when it says, "When you sin and you are guilty, when you acknowledge your guilt." You recognize you made a mistake, and that's what inspires you, impels you to do, to do tshuva, to right the wrong. It's that moment of honesty. It's that moment of clarity where you say to yourself, there are no rationalizations. I've got to do the right thing. Even when I know that other people do it, and other people rip off the government, and other people do this, and other people do that, and other people don't pay their HSD, and so why should I have to pay the HSD? Yada da 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 da. We all know the song, right? So there comes a time. 
You say to yourself, you know what? No more rationalizations, no more guilt. That's the moment where the Torah says, now you're ready to do Shiva. Now you're ready. Now you're ready. I'll take questions later. We're not going to do the rest of the... Um, <coughs> Uh, the, the rest of the Kliyuk are inside. I just want to point out, he says a couple of very, very telling things. One of the things he points out here is that notice the order of what you're supposed to do. The Torah says, first, pay back the person and then bring your karma. You know why? Because Hashem says, I'll wait for the karma. You swore falsely in my name. I, I get it. You have to atone for that. But you know what? Take care of your brother first. Take care of your brother. He's my child also. Pay him back what you owe him. And then you'll, take, then you'll deal with me. Because I got plenty of time, says Hashem. He may not have as much time as I have. So pay him back first, and then bring your card. And then in the next paragraph, he points out that the reason for the Chomesh is because we know in the laws of Tzedakah, that we know that harotz levazdez al yevazdez yoter mechomesh. That there's a halacha in laws of tzedakah that a normal person gives 10% of his income to charity, and a very righteous person who is very very generous gives up to a fifth. So that's what you're supposed to give for tzedakah, up to a fifth of your income in tzedakah. So why does the Torah say you have to pay it a fifth in a, in, in a penalty form? Because not only did you not use your money wisely and give away what Hashem asked you to give away, but you're withholding something that isn't even rightfully yours. And to remind you about how you're supposed to wisely use your money, that's why Hashem chose the specific measurement of the fifth, to remind you that the pious Jew gives away a fifth of his own honestly earned income. So therefore, you did just the opposite and therefore the penalty is you have to give him, pay him an extra fifth to remind you about what you're supposed to do next time with your, with your, with your properly earned gains. And this is where I'd like to direct our attention now for a moment to Passover, to Pesach. There's a very interesting halacha. We all know, and we're all probably, we've started in one way or another cleaning the house for Pesach. But a lot of times we miss the main point of Pesach. Everything that we do in this mundane world, even if it's for the sake of our religious observance, we should aspire to see a higher meaning in everything that we do, even when we're doing the most <coughs> mundane activity, like cleaning the house. There's a very interesting halacha that the Ramah, with Moshe Israelis, the co-author of the Shulchan Aruch, brings in talking about what areas of the house you're supposed to clean. So without going into all of the details, it just basically says you have to clean any room where there's a possibility that chametz may have gotten into. Right? So depending upon the age of your children, depending upon which rooms you know you bring food into, those are the rooms which have to be carefully cleaned for Pesach. So you all know that. We all know that halacha, right? And at the end he says, v'hakisim ovate yad shol begadim, that's the underlined section in source number three. In Simen Taf Lamed Gimel, the Ramah writes that pockets and also uh, um, also bate yad shall begadim, that sometimes clothing has like um, places for my hands to warm, hand warmers in, in my clothes. Bate yad are like gloves, but they could sometimes be attached to the building. Basically, any recesses or pockets in my clothing, if there's a possibility that I could have put food in my pockets, I have to clean out my pockets as well. So you have to check, make sure there's no chametz in there, clean out your pockets, clean out the clothes. I know that with me, it's not just, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna put a cookie in my pocket, We're not, not most of them, but what about a sucking candy, right? What about uh, the breath mints or whatever it is you're going to put in your pocket? So you have to check your clothes and make sure there's in your pockets. You don't have anything in there. Very straightforward halacha, right? Now listen to Rabbi Yeshaya Halevi Horowitz, the Shalah HaKadosh, 
who finds a much deeper significance in all of our cleaning for, for Pesach. This is really what I wanted to get to, source number four. He says, just going into a, a few words into the first line, he says, the Seder Hanachon. He says, really, what is the deeper meaning of doing Bedikas Chametz, of checking the house for Chametz? He says, Yifashfesh Adam B'ma'asav. It really means that a person has to scrutinize their ways. You've got to look for the leaven, the spoiled parts of your life. And there's spoiled parts of my life that are out in the open, which is my overt behavior. And then there's internal stuff that only I know about. That's chametz all the way deep down inside. The habedika, and how you're supposed to check when you do bedikas chametz the night before Pesach. What does the Mishnah say you're supposed to do? It's supposed to be la'or ner yichidi. You're supposed to use a single flame to do bedikas chametz, or a flashlight, but just a singular flame that's focused, a focused candle. Ratzal omar la'ashem lishmo. That single candle represents God. In other words, do it for the sake of Hashem. I'm doing the self-scrutiny, the self-analysis of removing my chametz inside of me for the sake of God. Hashem ori v'yishi, because after all we know we say, La David Hashem ori v'yishi, my God is my light and my salvation. So that candle that I'm holding the night of Bedikas chametz, that represents the light of God that's going to allow me to scrutinize myself and really see what I'm all about. Do a self-analysis. This is the connection to the Kliyakar Vahayaki Yechetavi Hashem. And that's why we're reading Sefer, we're reading this Parsha before Pesach, because it's all about Bedikas Chametz. And then um, he says that the Orla Arbasar, that light that we use the night of the 14th, Matzil Min Nu'um Hashem Asher Orlo B'Tzion, will save us from a great fire that will burn through Zion, which refers to the fires of Gan. And we also know that Avraham Avinu, as the Medrash tells us, also did a, a, an examination of all of the future gullios, of the future exiles that the Jews would be in, in order to try and save his future descendants from Gehenna. We'll skip that for now. Let's go now to the uh, fifth line. The Yivdo Kol Achurim V'Sadakim. The Mishnah says that I'm supposed to check in all of the crevices and cracks in my house. You know what those cracks and crevices represent? They represent the deeper inner recesses of my own heart. Because God ultimately knows what's going on in my heart. And there are many sins that a person does wantonly, many sins that a person does just, you know, without even thinking, and he forgets about them. But Hashem doesn't forget. You may have forgotten, but God says God, but I haven't forgotten. And therefore, a person has to do this bedika, has to do this examination. Let me think to myself, what have I really done over the past several weeks or months that I've totally forgotten about, and I left my chametz there, my proverbial chametz, right? What kind of chametz have I left lying around? And just like a person has to examine the chametz that may be lingering between himself and God, all of the times that I did, did things that were a disregard and I've allowed many of my mitzvahs to leaven and sour, I have to also examine the things that I've done offensively to my fellow man that have become leavened and soured. And that's why there's a Mishnah that says, that if, let's say, you live in an apartment building and there's a hole in the wall between you and your neighbor, you've got to check and go up to halfway into that wall to check that there's no chametz there because that's between you and your friend. You've also got to check that hole in between you and your friend. And therefore, everyone has to check and try to rectify whatever he can discover. And whatever chametz, what do we do after we do bedikas chametz? We do biur chametz. We say kol chamira v'chamia. Any leaven, I hereby declare to be null and void. 
And what does that represent? Moichel. I forgive. If there's any chametz left between myself and my fellow Jew, that he's done something offensive to me, hefker. I hereby nullify it. I hereby nullify it. It's as if it doesn't exist anymore. That's also what's going on the night before Pesach. Hein mamon, hein shar devarim shebeinehem. It could be anything, whether it's monetary issues, whether it's other issues of, of, of offense. That's the bitul chametz that I'm doing the night before Pesach. And then he quotes the Ramah that we just saw in source number three. He says, Tzorach livdok hakisen. The Ramah had said that you have to check your pockets. And you know what he says that means? He says, emet. Ki hakisin srichin pitika biyoter. Ki rova veirot bimamon. He says, the thing you got to check the most are your pockets. Because what do you keep in your pockets? Your wallet. He says, most things that we do wrong involve monetary issues. Involve monetary issues. Where we don't pay people what we really owe them. Where we withhold something that belongs to someone else. And by the way, that can also be, let's say, if I work for somebody and I don't put in the full day. I, I sort of shave off a few minutes here, a few minutes there. I'm on a private phone call when I'm supposed to be working. These are all things having to do with the pocket. And that also needs to be bedika. You have to have do bedika's chametz there as well. The talui balev, and a lot of these things are dependent upon what's going on in my heart. And as the as the Torah says, lo tachmod, you may not covet the halev talui bekis. And as we know, that the heart is always attached to the, the pocket. People's hearts are drawn after their pockets, and therefore that has to be checked carefully. And he goes on and he gives these, these ideas. Then he's in the last uh, three lines. He says, um, the, the Gemara in Yerushalmi says that synagogues and study halls also need to be examined. And that means that even though the place is holy, a synagogue is holy, you still have to check it for chametz. But you know what needs B'dikah's chametz? The things that I do in the synagogue and I do in the study hall. My Torah study, my prayer, I need to do B'dikah's chametz there also. Where have I been lackluster? Where have I fallen short? Where have I allowed my tefillah to become chametz? That also must be checked. And that's what the Gemara means, you have to check the synagogues. Gam li'idach gisa. And another way of looking at it, he says, He says, even if you see a person, meaning yourself, if you see yourself completely um, immersed in Torah, you see yourself with the talus over your head, speaking to a man, you see yourself with your talus over your head, shuckling and davening with tremendous kavana. Im you still have to check for chametz in that person as well, because maybe that person is not being honest. A lot of times, just because a person looks very from, and I'm speaking to myself, just because a person looks from doesn't mean he is from. You know that famous story, very related to the holiday we just had recently. I've told, you, I've mentioned this story many times before. There was a, in, the, in Satmar, the on Purim, there was a um, they were putting on the Purim spiel as they did every year. And one of the students started to imitate the Satma Rebbe. And so the Satma Rebbe had this unique way of davening with a very, very elongated pronunciation. And a special way of swaying back and forth and so forth. And everyone was laughing because it was a perfect imitation. But then they noticed that there was one person in the back who wasn't laughing. The Satma Rebbe had come into the room and instead of laughing, he was crying bitter tears. So, of course, the young student who was doing the imitation was mortified, and he quickly ran over to the Rebbe to ask for forgiveness. And the Rebbe said, no, the reason why I was crying was not because of your imitation, but rather because I reminded myself because of what I saw that many times I also imitate the Satma Rebbe. And so we have to remember that there are times when we imitate the pious image that we have of ourself. So how, how much of our piety 
is real piety and how much of our piety has become chametz and we're just going through the motions of piety because that's who we think we are. So all of this goes back to that the key is ve'ashem. We gotta, we all rationalize. We all figure, ah, there's no chametz there, there's no chametz there, what do I have to worry about? But that's what Badika's chametz is before Pesach. You know, people have this misconception that tshuva is only something that I do in Chodesh Elul before Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. It's not true. This is the time also for Badika's chametz, for checking, doing a little bit of self-scrutiny, self-analysis, and trying to figure out is it just the physical chametz that I'm getting rid of, or do I need to get rid of the deeper chametz that's in my soul? And that's the reason why I think that uh, this is an appropriate exercise for us to look at right before uh, Yantif. And with that, I want to wish you a chag kasheva sameh. But is there a question, a comment? Thank you. When you say rationalize, yes. rational lies. Rational lies. Yes. Rational lies. Yes. Rational lies. Yes. Very good. Well, well done. Well done. Instead of rationalize is one word, it's rational lies. Oh.